Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the latest edition of Lanky Beat. This is the Lanky Beat, English Red Rose County of Lancashire, on the, putting Lancashire on the world's rock and roll map. I got blue suede shoes and pink Cadillacs. Give me the backbeat that takes them back. Scrub my guitar, boy, and pump up that bass. Spread my name all over the place. Hit them drums like you're gonna kill them. Get so heavy, put some concrete in them. I don't wanna I did what I did. Don't mess up my tension. With hits of yesterday and today, Wrightington Hospital Radio. Hey, 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 that, that, that was a bit of a good old-fashioned rocking stuff, wouldn't it? Hey, it's and so nice. yet, yet, uh, it's, um, it's all ultra-modern, because that's George's Big Shed. And George's Big Shed, a three-piece from Bickerstaff near Ormskirk. How about that? I mean, can the lads rock? And uh, did they uh, rock the place up when they came back uh, to Lanky Cats just recently? Oh, what about that, Diane? They certainly did. They were absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. With the boiler suits. Yeah, they, is it them boiler suits? They're, they're not like flight suits, what they are. The, yeah, they're like, uh, yeah, the American, like working off the, off the American yeah. Air, Air Force Base uh, in, uh, in London, weren't they? I mean, it was, it's amazing. Quite and impressive. That, I know, absolutely. That's a, a, a five-track CD called... A Bright Future Behind Us, so a quirky title there, and it's made by Big Shed Records, so that's George and uh, his Big Shed, that's fantastic stuff. Anyway, we've got a, a fun-packed show lined up for you tonight, I'm glad to say we've long lost, long, long lost, I've been dying to get this guy on the programme, and it's Bob McKinley, formerly of the Long and the Short, 
and uh, they didn't have to do some good stuff back in the 60s and Bob's still doing it even now so it'll be great to have him on the show and find out what he's all about and where he all where it all came from with him and uh, so on but an exciting development this week and I can't tell you uh, how much I'm so pleased uh, for the hospital radio station, the Wrightington Hospital radio station, has been relaunched in a brand new studio here in smack in the middle of the reception area, isn't it? And together with Diane here tonight, who's going to tell me all about uh, what it took to put this fantastic new studio together. Diane, well done, first of all. For Thank you. Say. Thank you. What you've done, you and you guys and the committee and everybody pulling together in the last 12, uh, it's again, you're beyond 12 months now, isn't it? It was just 12 months, end of October, yeah, wasn't I know. it? Yeah, I know. And like, um, we were faced with studio closure. We had hardly any money. Um, and we said we've got two months and the closing is down. That was September last year. So we closed down uh, end of October. We thought, what do we do now? So we're trying, we're trying to find somewhere to go. So we found somewhere, and they said, right, you need so much money. Then um, the hospital, your friend stepped in and said, we'll sort it out. So they funded the building work um, for that, which was about £12,000, £15,000, something like that. Mm -hmm. Then we brought the old equipment over from over there, and we've reinstalled it here. We had to buy some new bits. We've uh, done... I think we've done a good job of the decor. I love the decor in here. It's fantastic. And we've got, like, it looks like, you'll have to put a picture of the studio on, but it looks like, um, it looks quite professional, doesn't it? What do you mean, quite professional? I've been in uh, a few radio stations and uh, it's equal, if not superior, to some of them. Well, I've designed it along the BBC lines. Yeah. Uh, mo monitors where you need them in front of you, on the wall, television above. Um, we've got record player in here, we've got mini disc, two CD players, another CD player for playing jindles. Mm. Got a backup system when we're not on earth that's going to be utilised this week. And it's fantastic. The, the side of the screen's been removed so we can see through the window. Yeah, yeah. And, um, uh, and look at the reception area and watch who's coming in and going yeah, we're, out. And we're they in can the, see us. We're in the PIC, which is the main entrance of the hospital. And it's fantastic. I just look, I'm so excited about it. I think you put down the roots here. For a long, long time, haven't you? Dan? I hope so, but um, we had our official opening on Tuesday. Oh, well, that was like, like the, like I said, this week, yeah, because that's where I came yeah. from. And what happened on the official opening? How did you do it? It was opened by um, Barb Lambert and the chair of the Wrighton Hospital uh, Trust, Les Higgins. And we got two pair of scissors and gone both to cut the ribbon at the same time. Right. We had the Hospital Broadcasting Association North West Rep down here. We had um, the people from the hospital who helped us secure sites and all types. Of, all, the, all, all the dotted lines that needed to be crossed, they've helped us with all that. So with the help of the NHS, just for your friends, we've got to where we are now. I know, fantastic. And what about the reaction? Have you had any feedback from the patients and the staff here? People have, found, have made up that we're back on the air. Uh, hmm. uh, we've had nurses coming in here having a look. We've had uh, all sorts of people coming around having a look from cleaners, um, various staff at the hospital, nurses, fantastic. doctors, the chaplains is involved now. Yeah, They're yeah. starting out doing some shows and of for course, us. Radio, uh, right into hospital radio doesn't just do say music and bits and programs like mine. It it does things like go down to uh, Wigan Rugby League, doesn't it, and covers commentary down oh, there. Yes, commentary comes from there. That's brought into the studio and it's sent into the studio to Charlie and Preston. Fantastic, um, and that's networking with Charlie and Preston hospitals, yeah. isn't it? Up yeah, up there. yeah. But um, from uh, I think it's the tenth of next month, Charlie and Preston are two separate items. Right. They are splitting and Preston's going their way. And Charlie are going their way, right? So we'll be still sending to Charlie, right? Okay, that's that's good. Uh, that's good for them if that's the way they want it. On and the third uh, of November, we've got uh, an informal get together at Warrington with various other hospital radio stations. Uh, we're going over to Warrington there, and they've put that together. So I'm looking forward to that. That's fantastic. I mean, Diane Herring, for those of you who don't know, uh, she's chair of the Wrightington Hospital Radio committee in other words she's the number one pivot of the uh, operation and until next week <laughs> and then at AGM next week uh, 
we're going to be having an exciting meeting up there. I'm, uh, I won't predict what might be happening up there, but I think it, it's going to be... An AGM, got, yeah, anything can the happen. The AGM, anything can happen, that's right, that's right. Let's not, let's not say any more. But what I'm trying to get to is the fact that Diane is the innovator of networking with other hospital radio stations, which I think is an the absolutely fantastic thing to do. Because that means they'll be able to swap shows, swap programmes, overlap with the uh, same ideas, and of course it gets a broader audience uh, involved. Which fantastic. Uh, the idea behind everything. that was that sometimes we don't have a live show on, we've got recorded stuff on. But if there's something on a show that's good, why do we not take it? And they've, they've got recorded things on, and we've got good life, why do they not take it? That's how we've been looking at it. Oh. Because I'd rather have something live going it than recorded stuff. So I'm so, so proud to announce our first Lanky Beat show is being broadcast to you from the new studio in Writington Hospital Radio Foyer. That's not so on. It's I got, brilliant, I got there isn't eventually. it? Yeah, yeah. Which brings me on to the Remo 4, which has nothing at all to do with it. But there you go, the next up on the programme. Here's Walk Don't Run. Remo 4, Walk Don't Run. And you know, it might sound a bit aged that, but the reason is it was recorded in 1961. And it says on the CD cover here, uh, The Iron Door. That's uh, a club in Liverpool that was made quite yeah, Silla famous. Silla was there, wasn't she? That's right, yeah, yeah. I seen the interview last week with Silla and she said she's going to the Iron Door and sell coffee. Absolutely, absolutely. And it, it's nearly as famous in Liverpool as the, as the Cavern because the Cavern was associated with the Beatles. And the iron door associated with the searchers. That's right. how it kind of how it all kind of worked out. And uh, I managed to play there uh, just at the very end of its the era. It was oh, it was early seventies, I think about nineteen seventy seventy one. And I had my band Tinfoil at the time. We got a gig up there at the iron door, and it was a Sunday night, and there was nobody in, hardly anybody anyway. It was dying on its backside. I'm afraid it was to be a little bit crude about it. Times but have moved on from the 60s, I haven't know, they? But there was a guy behind a hatch, you know, like a ha like a serving hatch, like I expected like kind of uh, meals to come out or something. Yeah. And the guy behind that serving hatch was the guy called Billy Butler. R Radio Lancashire, sorry, no. Radio Merseyside Mer yeah. and oh. Radio City. Absolutely. Uh, and, and Billy. I know Billy. Uh, Billy, <laughs> Billy Butler, uh, OBE, yeah for services to broadcasting. He was there that night. Well, he's also known as MBE. MBE. Mrs right. Butler's eldest. Mrs Butler's eldest. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I know, I know. Well, we'll cope. 
we'll not need to edit that bit. I think that's fantastic. <laughs> yes, sir. So, Billy Butler, I, I tell you what, though, he upset us. He upset me. I've never forgot it. Because uh, he didn't like us. And I don't know whether it's because it was all coming to an end and he, or, or he, he, he was getting a bit fed up with it, things or whatever. He was tired. Uh, but he didn't like us and he let us know about it. And he said it across the microphone. He said something quite derogatory. And when I went down and I went on his programme uh, about three years ago, and I reminded him of it, but of course he couldn't remember. And uh, but I reminded him of it. I said he didn't. It like could have been much. having a bad night. Simply it could have been. I mean, DJs. What, what are they like, Diane? DJs having a good night, bad night. Does it come across when you, you know? Well, you shouldn't let it. You should rise above it. It's a professional. But sometimes things do get to you. I know. I know. I know. Uh, but you know, we've digressed there quite a bit. And uh, the Remo Four. Let's not take it away. I wanted to talk about the Remo Four. At one stage, you had Johnny Sandon fronting the Remo Four. It was Johnny Sandon and the Remo Four folks. And um, uh, the drummer on that particular track was a guy called Harry Prithich. Now Harry is still active in the business, and he was at Lanky Cats last, last week. Last week, yeah. And what he does, he does lots of different things, but he goes uh, around and kind of gives chats and talks uh, about uh, the Mersey scene, the Merseyside beat groups and so on, in the 60s, and I believe he's very, very entertaining. I, I didn't make I, it. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, what kind of things was he talking about? He brought this jacket in with him and said, that was in the Silla thing three times in the Silla programme. Yeah. And he's going on about, like, um, playing with the Beatles, many times he played the Beatles and... All sorts of things like the cavern. Um, I, mean, I find it very interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I, don't, I believe, believe it. He can go on and on and on and on. I wish know, he had a do because I really enjoyed it. Uh, uh, depending on how long he's got, you know. But uh, I think we'll, what we need to do is get him back. I'd love and, to see him do half an hour. And, and give him, yeah, we'll do that. We'll, do, we'll get him back and do that. And, um, <clears throat> and, and get more to it. And of course, I want to see him as well because I was away on holiday. So I, di I didn't manage to catch Harry, but thank you very much, Harry, for what you've done for, for Lanky Cats. And also, I'll give you a plug because Harry is very involved over at the Fort Perch Rock in New Brighton, and they're putting shows on, uh, like you know, every week at least, at least every week. And during during the summer, they've been doing Sunday afternoons, and Lanky Cats were invited down, and one of our bands, the Cutting Crew, was it the Cutting Crew? Yes. I think it was, yeah. No, the night crew. Sorry. Sorry, boys. The night crew, uh, they went over there, represented Lanky Cats, and uh, did a great set. They got a great real press for doing all that. And Harry put that show together alongside Doug Darrock, who's uh, also beavering away over there. And it's a unique venue, so if you ever get the chance to get over there, have a look at Fort Perch Rock and uh, see what um, they, you can come up with as far as that's concerned. OK, let's move it on and let's get some more music underway. Here's Still Standing. I love, got no time for explanation. 
Still Standing was the previous track there. Fantastic, those guys, you know. And I played, I backed them up the uh, the other day and uh, played drums with them. And it was like, God, just, it's just like walking to, into an, a band I, I played with for Donkey's Years. You know, that's the kind of um, happy, happy that I went into with oh, them. Yeah. I've never played with them before. Oh. And they loved what I did and I loved what they did and we made a cracking sound. I mean, the audience walked out like, well, <laughs> no, I'm only joking. No, I'm we not. did have a, a fun time with uh, Still Standing. But here we go. That was the rock and roll tune for the night. And uh, Yellow River was the track that they played. Now, here's a familiar sounding track. I wonder if you'll recognise this. <laughs> Okay, well, that's uh, uh, something for you to contemplate there. That's a track called The Letter. And the guy I've got sat at the side of me here, he had something to do with that. Bob McKinley, welcome. Good right evening, in, Bill. How are you? Yeah, well, to, 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 right into Hospital Radio and yeah. the Lanky Beat Show. Fantastic to see you. And that is just the starting point of Bob and what fascinating stories he's got to come and coming in to tell us all about tonight. What's behind that, Bob? How did that happen to you 
in those particular days? Well, uh, the first group I had was called La Ringos, after Ringo Starr. Really? And we went out as a that folk... Was, can I just start with that? Yeah. It was Le... L, yeah, French. apostrophe, French r Ringos. It was supposed to be French. And in my uh, small understanding of French, you don't pronounce the kind of, it's Laringo, Laringo. They don't say, the R's are kind of silent, like in L'Hopital, which means the hospital. So it's a, the Ringos, really. It's French, yeah, well, everybody it? used to say L Ringos, I which know. is wrong. Nobody pronounced it Laringos. I know, you know, I know. But, but uh, um, we never had a lead guitarist, we were just a four-piece then, right. and we had a piano. Now the only problem was, every venue we played, we had to tune the guitars to the piano which was available. Well, of course, all right. But, of course, some of the pianos had not been used for years and years and years, and they were out of tune and everything. And... Um, and that's because you wouldn't carry your own piano around with you, isn't it? Well, the electric piano in those <laughs> days was uh, non-existent, you know what I mean? Absolutely. So just imagine your, your pianist uh, carrying a, a piano around. Uh, it's just not on, was it? it was just, just, oh, no, you couldn't not carry a piano carry. around. So every venue, nearly every venue, every stage had a piano on it, didn't it? Yeah, it pushed to one side and never used. I know. You know what I mean? Because um, in those days you had um, the electronic organ. Course, you know the big one. I forgot yeah, what it's called. The Hammonds and things. The like Hammonds, that. yeah, that's right. The Lowry, the Lowry organs and Lamond organs, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, it was very restricting as a four piece because half of the time you couldn't hear the piano because pickups for pianos were hard to find. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, of course. Anyway, do you not stick a microphone in it or something? Or open no, top and uh, stick a microphone in. The piano player managed to get some army pickups. Small pickups, yeah. what they used in the army for some reason or other. Yeah. Only got about four or five. So every night when we turned out, he'd get drawing pins and push them all over the place. So the piano was mic'd up. This was the early micing up, folks, wasn't it? The, oh, it, it was, was yeah. done all the time now on stages. Diane will tell us all about micing up. I love blinking out. But uh, there you go, that, micing up the piano. Then you could bring it up. Yeah. You need an amplifier now, don't you? You need an amplifier. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, he had a, his own amplifier. And, that, and, and he had to kind of get and adjust the volume on that to suit the rest of the band. Yeah, that's right. And, you, and, and that's uh, how you got away with a piano on stage. But we missed that lead guitarist. Yeah. And one day, a guy turned up who moved from Liverpool to Ashton. Mm. Ashton in Makerfield. Ashton that is. in Makerfield. Must make sure Ashton in Makerfield. Oh yeah, Ashton yeah. in Makerfield. That's near Wigan, folks. If so. But yeah. he, he'd been playing with. Um, he had his own quartet called the Les Stewart Combo. Yeah. And George Harrison was in with him. Really? Yeah, George. I read George's um, autobiography and yeah. he said, I left the Skiffle group to join a better outfit called the Les Stewart Combo. I never knew he was in another band. Oh, yeah, he's, I also played with um, Les Stewart. He called himself Les Saint for tax purposes. Oh, and right. <laughs> he um, used to play with Lee Castle and the Barons, if I you remember that. Yeah, yeah, right. But... Uh, we met him and he wanted a job. And we were playing at the Colt Hall one night and he brought his amplifier and his guitar and he played like nobody else I'd heard. He played all the Carl Perkins stuff, you know yeah, what I mean? All yeah. the Chuck Berry stuff, right. everything. And at the break, I walked off the stage and a guy came to me and he says, you're on your way now, you've got him. And he's transformed the band. Yeah. And that was true. Fantastic. But and he that, sang as well, you and, see. And that was the El Ringos. That was your first manifestation of a band, was it? Yeah. I mean, yeah. you played guitar, I take it back. Oh, yeah. You played yeah. guitar. I remember you as a guitarist. Yeah, up that's front. right. That's my, my memory of you. Yeah. Uh, Wigan Emp, Wigan Court Hall, places oh, like that. Yeah, that's yeah. I remember you. And, you know, uh, but I remember you then, because that wasn't the band I was looking at. It was a band called The Long and the Short, wasn't it, that I was looking at? Yeah, well... Um, so what, what what year do you think about was the El Ringos? What 1963. Year? 1963. What we, was what Before that, before you got into the band, you were playing guitar, were you just playing in your bathroom or something and singing to that? What, what were you doing before that? Before that, well, um, 
I had a guitar, and of course I had the um, book we play in a day book. All right, yeah. And that's yeah. where I learned the first few chords. Yeah. And then, of course, I improved quite a bit. I could only play 12 bar bill, you know what I mean? And, that, uh, that, blunt, blimey. And a few chords, there's a you lot know of, I mean? There's a lot of bands made a fortune out of them three chords. Oh, they did, yeah. <laughs> Haven't they? Yeah. But that was about 1963. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But what happened, um, William Leyland oh, yeah. took us over as manager. Right. And it went along nicely. He got us some bookings. And then one day... He came to us and said, um, I deal with Selector Records. I get me records for me jukeboxes at Selector Records in Manchester. Right. And I've asked them, could they get Bill, um, what's his name? Um, I forget his name. The Decker manager to come up mm. and listen and audition his bands right. with a view to a recording contract. So there was all the good bands in the area set up in the Monaco ballroom, some on the floor. Right. We were on the stage. And um, my band always moved around a lot. We never stood still. Yeah. We, I got that idea from Little Richard on the Rockin' Vickers. Yeah. And I was very competitive. If I was on an, another band, I was going to be the best one on. Oh, right, yeah. Because we moved around such a lot. Yeah, yeah. And um, lo and behold, uh, Dick Rowe it was who came from Decker. All right, Dick Rowe, yeah. And uh, I said to the lads the night before, move like you've never moved before. And when, and he that, said, when he said move, you just mean that kind of special movement on stage that is definitely rock and roll. I don't yeah, think that's the, it's that rock and roll stuff. You can't stand still, sit still. To rock and roll, can you? Yeah, well, a lot uh, of bands, was flying all over the place. A lot of bands just stood there, didn't they? Yeah, that's right. They didn't move. That was the, that's and, um, and 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 some of the bands choreographed the moves. Others just moved, but casually. But a lot of bands didn't move, and that's and they were like statues on stage. A lot of bands, weren't they? Well, there was a band called the Mad Men. And they never moved an inch. Did they not? No. I know. Anyway, uh, Dick Rowan <laughs> came forward to the stage. And he said, you change your name to the long and the short. Some have longer, some have shorter. Yeah, yeah. But apparently he had a bee in his bonnet about Uchi Kuchi Man. And yeah. we did it. That was the song Uchi Kuchi Man, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's right. Because Was there a band called Uchi Kuchi Men? I don't know. I, don't I think know. that was the Long John Baldry. Ah, Right, okay. Yeah, I think so. I'm sorry to cut across you, but that I thought, yeah, but anyway, go on. And uh, he had a bee in his bonnet about Uchi Kuchi Man. I don't know why, but um, he chose us out of all the bands for a recording contract. Fantastic. And um, we went down to London and they sent me to Tin Pan Alley, as it was called then, yeah, yeah. Denmark Street. That's right. And they used to get all the acetates from the United States of the latest American records. And they'd, they'd play a few, and I said, I love that, and I love that. So what I chose was the, was the letter written by Sonny and Cher. But when they played their version, it was a nice, harmonised ballad, and that's what attracted me. Right. And I chose another one uh, called Here Comes the Fool. And uh, what was on the air side of that? I forget, anyway. Yeah. But oh, um, yeah. we went to the studio, and believe me, the A&R man walked in, and we didn't exist. Mm. We'd rehearsed the number like Sonny and Cher, mm. but they never they weren't interested. They, they just did what they wanted to do. And they had Jimmy Page as lead guitarist. Right. And suddenly, we finished up with the letter as it is, which I didn't like personally, mm. although it sold 10,200, yeah. which is not bad for a first-time recording, you know right, what I mean? Right, right. But um, Mike Leander was the fellow's name, who was A&R man. Right. He produced um, Under the Boardwalk for the Drifters. Fantastic. And he never came and said hello. 
never shook our hands or nothing. Yeah. And we just went with the flow and turned up with that record. But uh, I've heard it tonight and I quite like it, actually. I do. I've always liked it. I've, I, I've not heard it for, oh, God knows. I've not heard it for about five years. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. But um, it was number one on Radio Caroline and Fantastic. Liverpool. I know, I know, I know. And didn't another band cover it as well and, get, and make a, a, a hit with it? No, that was um, The Box Tops, right. The Letter, which is a different number a totally. A different song altogether. Yeah, that's right. Glad you made that very clear, because I've never quite understood that. Because when uh, the, both titles of the record is the same, isn't it? Exactly the, the same, yeah. But one, that one we just listened to, um, done by The Long and The Short. Yeah. That is your version that Sonny and Sher wrote. And the other one is the box tops called The Letter, of which have we, if we have a copy, we might play it. But anyway, it's, a Bob Mc, it's the Bob McKinley show, and um, we want to uh, get, get in underneath his skin, as it were, and find out a lot, lot more. Bob's got so much to set, tell us about so many things. We, uh, we need now just to have a short uh, remission and... Listen to this next song. Um, this is again by the long and the short. Yeah, sung was it by, by Les? By Les Les Saint. Yeah, Les Saint. Yeah. And uh, this is uh, what, and he'd written it as well, hasn't he? Yeah, which um, in those days was a rarity, really. Yeah, but I it's know. a good song. Uh, um, mm. Right, but that was uh, the long and the short with a track there written and um, sung by Les Saint. Tell Les us Saint. a bit more about how that came about, Bob. Um, well, Les came up with this number and uh, Love's a Funny Thing. 
And um, he said, why not record this? And I thought it was such a good song that um, I, I let him sing it and the studio left the band alone <clears throat> for this number and we all played and Les played and sang. And he was a great guitarist and, and, and a good singer, you know what I mean? Mm. A not good all round talent then, isn't but, it? I mean, but Decker le left us alone in the studio for yeah. for that number. You know what I mean? And putting it into kind of perspective of the, of the era, it was quite unknown for bands not to write their own songs until perhaps Lennon McCartney came along with the Beatles. But even they mainly did covers most oh, yeah. of the time. It was only when they kind of were moving into the record business that yeah. uh, George Martin said to him, have you got anything of your own? Because he'd just given them would it, something like um, How Do You Do It by Jerry and Jerry, Jerry and the, the Pacemakers, Pacemakers made a hit out of that. Yeah. And the Beatles hated that. They recorded it. I heard a version of it once. Oh, did you? I did, I. And it was it was rubbish. It, it wasn't good because it wasn't the kind of song. And I think Lennon McCartney went away, wrote their own particular songs and the rest, as they say, is history. I mean, But it wasn't a precedent for uh, singers in bands, bands in general, to produce their own material like that, was it? And here was Les Saint, way ahead of everybody, wasn't it? Yeah, it's a good song. It's a, a strong song, you know, but um, we had it in the film, Gonks Go Beat, yeah. which we appeared in. Right. And um, I mimed to it. Right. Les didn't sing it in the film. Yeah. They had the cameras on me. You know what right. I mean? I, uh, yeah, right. I, I, I mind the song Fantastic. as though it was me singing. Gonk score beat. We'll have a chat about that. Oh, I yeah. think that's further down the line, but we will have a chat about that. I'm, I'm dying to start talking to you about that. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we, what we must do, we must try and kind of keep on track, I suppose is, is yeah. the word, and keep... Um, and keep some kind of um, yeah, the togetherness with the, the band as it progressed because it was the El Ringos on to then the long and the short. That's right. And then what kind of then, apart from, you know, doing the letter, um, what kind of things were happening to you after that? Well, you produced the, the letter, you sold 10,000, what is it, 400? 200, yeah. 10,200. And then what happened? Did it make you big stars at the time? Oh, well, we got on the um, rock and roll circuit and uh, we did about eight television shows. Fantastic. All the top television shows of the day. We did Thank You, Look at Stars. Right. Seen at 6.30. Oh. And uh, we, BBC Two had just opened. Yeah. And they put a rock and roll show on there and we were on with the animals and yeah. other people. And uh, we appeared with Dave Clark Five and... The Hollies and all these people. So you were up the the with them all. Yeah, I mean, on the household names now, aren't they? On the strength of that record. On that, on that. But one. of course. But it was a good record. It's a good record. Well, I've it? just heard it for the first time in years. I've I said, know, and I know. it sounds okay. It does. But um, you're riding on the crest of the record, and once the record starts to fade, you've got to go back in the studio, and try and better it. Mm. And mm. then you're on your way again. But this time, we made a record called Shock Ice, which was absolutely dire. Was I couldn't sing it. Les sang it. But Lulu sang it, and it sounded great. But it's no. not a man's song, really, you know what I mean? Yeah, I know. Chocolate Ice. Chocolate Ice nice. Cream. Yeah. Shock Ice, as in choco chocolate yeah, ice cream. Yeah, that's right. So you were singing a song about chocolate ice cream. Chocolate ice is a very nice. And all oh, that. right, right. Oh, that I've, kind of thing. I have heard of it, but I, I don't think I've ever heard the song. Uh, I must well, it didn't sell many, and of course, yeah. Um, yeah. if you didn't keep up the impetus, you know, with your second record, the contract went. So we lost the contract with Decker. Right. But we still played. Right. But. Um, and played work, did mainly in the north of England, or did no, you tour all over all the, the, all the UK? Yeah, it was all over the Give place. Give me some examples of what, you know the gigs you used to play UK, not the north of England. Oh, well, uh, we actually did a one-night stand in uh, Austell in Cornwall. Right. Well, in those days, the motorway ended at Cannock. Yeah, that's right. And from then that's on, Birmingham, yeah. you were on the B roads. Yeah. But we actually had to cross Dartmoor. You did. And if you saw a car coming the other way, you had to pull off the road 
and let the car go past. <laughs> and we arrived in St Austell, and this is a one-night stand, and it's a long way, because we didn't have another gig to go to from it. And when we got there, there was a balcony around the stage, and all the uh, roughnecks were flicking lighted cigarettes onto us while we were playing. You know what I mean? Which is not uh, the easiest thing to play when that's happening. I've never is heard it? of that. Like flicking lighted cigarettes onto the stage. Yeah. But yeah. Um, then we had to come back home. And there was only one driver. You know what I mean? So <laughs> it's a long way to St Austin. <laughs> I reckon from this neck of the woods where you live in, that's about th at least 350 miles. It's got to be, yeah. I know. On roads where you had to move over if a car came the other way. Well, on Dartmoor, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and no motorways. Well, I can tell you that Newquay is 330 yeah. miles. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and it's a lot further than that. Thanks for that, Diane. Yeah. yeah, that's great. But um, we played that. One, one incident, we were playing at Smedic Baths in Birmingham. And we were supporting the Hollies. Right. Anyway, we were set up, went into the dressing room and sat down. No sign of the Hollies. Then suddenly, Alan Clark walks in. I said, Alan, I said, where's the band? He says, the bass player's down the road in a pub with all the equipment. And he didn't know where anybody else was. So he disappeared. And the manager says, we don't have the Hollies. Can you play double time? Because oh. you'll have to to fill in to the time. Yeah. So we played and we went down very well. Yeah. And he came in and he said, um, you did so good, I'm going to boot you again and you'll be top of the bill. So the day came and we were motored off to Birmingham and we broke down on the way. Oh. And never arrived at the venue. Yeah. So, oh. You know, these this um, happens a lot, doesn't it? You know what I mean? But I mean, the thing is, you'd no mobile phone. You could ring ahead and say, "We're no, stuck on no, the, we we're stuck here, in a trench, yeah, in a, in, it's out of the motorway with a broken down van and a, full of equipment and four very uh, disappointed lads." I mean, you could have rung ahead and you know, this is what I said. But you, to the other end, it's a band that just didn't turn up, isn't it? Yeah, know, it we couldn't contact them. You see, I know, I know. but. Um, in those days, the vans were very poor quality. Everybody were. went for the comma van. That's it. And that was a diesel. <laughs> and forever, you had to bleed the fuel pipes <laughs> because it kept breaking down. Oh. And it was... Um, and then another time, we were booked at um, Bristol Corn Exchange right. where Eddie Cochran and Gene Vincent had played and all yeah. the rest of them. Yeah. And we broke down again 14 miles from the venue. Oh, anyway, in those days, you could thumb a lift yeah. and people would pick you up. Yeah. So I thumbed a lift, went down to the corn exchange, and there's a bloke stood outside with a straw hat on. I said, I'm the band for tonight, but we've broken down. He says, too bad, I've got another band. So ah. all these mishaps. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, I find them fascinating. They're absolutely fascinating because it tells you what was really going on. I mean, you, you only ever really hear about the glamour side of things, don't you? Uh, oh, yeah. What happens yeah. To, you know, you're, you're, you're swigging champagne in hotels and throwing televisions out the, you know, the hotel window. That's all you kind of hear about. But these are the real nitty-gritty stories. That, yeah, the, uh, I mean, so you, of course, you, you lose your money. Of course you do. So no wages, no money. So, um, well, yeah. and it was a new van bill. Yeah. It was a brand new comma van, uh -huh. which um, the London management had paid for. Goodness me. And uh, they'd break down, and you had to, I didn't understand it really, you had to believe the fuel system. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I that happened a lot. Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, we'll get you a brand new van, lads, you know, and it will be, you know, that's reliable, and it make sure you get to all these gigs on a brand new Comma van brought down onto it on the way to, <laughs> to it. Yeah, but to unfortunately, in those days, they didn't book you out in order. One night you'd be in Glasgow, and the next night, as I said, you'd be in St. Austell, Cornwall. Yeah. And yeah. then some nights you'd do a double. Yeah. Well, it meant playing and packing up all your gear and breaking your neck to get to the next venue. Yeah. And that, that happened in. Uh, so, 
yeah. the Midlands, yeah. didn't yeah. he? So, was it, a, was it an agent or a manager that was getting these gigs for you? And it, could he not sit down with his piece of paper and say, right, well, that date they're in Glasgow, this date, and following day they're in St. Ossel. He could, have, could he not finally work it out a bit better than that? Not really, not could in those not? days. They, no. You know, they, they could only take a book and if they were offered, really. Yeah, so it, whatever was offered, you'd try and deliver on it. Yeah. He tried to get his bookings uh, a bit sensibly, if you like, Yeah. but it never really happened, do you know what I mean? I know. And as I say, Les, the, the um, guitarist, who could afford a van, he had a minivan, yeah, because he was um, he could afford a van, and right. sometimes he'd go on his own, you see. Ah, right. So he yeah. didn't break down. No. And we only had one driver, which was a drummer. Yeah, All right. And he was exhausted. Yeah. Talking about other members of the band, what who were they in your band? The long and the short. Well, there was Bob Taylor from Standish. Yeah, yeah. He joined when he was 17. And he played which instrument? He played bass. He played bass. I know Bob very well. He, didn't he become a policeman later on? Oh, yeah, I yeah. He, he came to my house where we're having a party on New Year's Eve. Did he? And these two coppers turned up at back door. Well, every, everything just stopped dead. Yeah. Two cops walking in the back door. I can't believe it. And then he took his helmet off and it was Bob Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> was it Bob? It, his joke. <laughs> the funny thing was, when he was on point duty at the top of Wigan, yeah. and the convent girls came out, and the high school girls, yeah. they remembered him from the band, and they are saying, are you going to them place tonight, Bob? Uh, oh, fantastic. <laughs> so he was only 21 then. I know, I know. You know what I mean? So, um, Fant fantastic bloke. Oh, he is. Yeah, uh, I, know. I see him regular now, actually. I know. He comes to Lanky Cats now and again, you know. Yeah, I've not seen right. him for a while, but it'd be great to see him again. Yeah. Oh, and... Uh, the piano player was actually from Liverpool. Right. And he was um, on the door at the cavern. Right. And what was uh, his name? His name was Jerry Watt. Jerry Watt. Yeah, and uh, right. I met him. Uh, I had to go on day release course to uh, Liverpool College of Art. Right. And so did he. Right. And there was a piano in the canteen. And one day I'm sat there and I could hear this boogie woogie going. So uh, I went across to him and had a listen. And I said to him, do you want to join a group? And he said, yeah. And do you know, he used to come all the way from Liverpool to practice in uh, Ashton in Makerfield. Fantastic. Just me and him. Right. In the old church, St. Yeah. Peter's, right. before they knocked it down. Fantastic. And they had a piano in there. I know, I know. But uh, Jerry was a great boogie-woogie piano player. So there was you on... Lead guitar vocals. No, not lead guitar, rhythm guitar. Rhythm guitar vocals. Oh, yeah. Then there was Les Saint. Les Saint, lead guitar vocals. Lead guitar vocals. Then Bob there was Taylor. Bob Taylor on bass. And singing. They sang a few songs. Yeah. I didn't stop anybody singing. If they, no, no. If they came up and said, Bob, I'd like to sing this. Right. So they did, but Bob only sang about three, you know what I mean? Right, that's all right. Yeah. And who else? Alan Grinley uh, yeah. on drums. Right. Now, his son was David Grinley. Right. who was in the Olympic Games. Right. He was the second fastest man in the world at one stage. Right. What, what event was that at, David Grant? 400 metres. Really? Right. Well, he got a bronze medal uh, for the uh, relay, 400 metres. Fantastic. At the Olympic Games. Well, well, well. Now then, that's so, a little bit of history that, uh, well, quite amazing, quite amazing. And now, we, uh, with all the money he earned from racing, I didn't know they got paid. They do now, yeah. He yeah. used to get sometimes thirty thousand dollars for a race, Goodness one race, me. and uh, with all the money he made, he went to uh, Milton Keynes to learn how to be a pilot, and now he's flying jumbo jets all over the place. <laughs> magic, absolutely magic story that. Well, that gives us a nice little interlude there because we're going to play another track. Oh, yeah. We're getting to the end of our little conversation. I, don't, I feel we've only just scratched the surface here, but anyway, oh. we'll plod on. This is the uh, track called Rock and Roll With Me. Yeah, I wrote Again, it. That's, this is by... You've written this book. I've written them all on there. Right, them all on this particular uh, CD. And uh, he arranged it, and your guy called Danny Wood helped you along with it. Oh, Danny was playing lead guitar. Right, and uh, so this is Rock and Roll With Me. <laughs> Oh, 
That does uh, a, a nice little intro into the kind of music, Bob. You now started to write, yeah, uh, as well as perform. Oh yeah, performing was no problem. No, he's writing and performing your own songs with a bunch of session musicians, no less. Oh yeah. So and that was one of the tracks that you'd written. And, yeah, that's right. Um, and so tell tell us what uh, how you managed to come into that here, where you decided you're going to start writing a bit uh, your, your own material. Well, really, um, in a way, I thought you don't get anywhere unless you write your own material. Amen. So yeah. um, that's what I did, and um, on that um, particular CD you've got, I wrote a song called "Restless," and somebody put a dance to it for line dancers, and it's played all over Great Britain. It's still today, and I, I recorded it about twenty years ago. Yeah, it says that it's summer of 1989 on here. Is that what it says? Yeah, that's what it says. Well, it I know it's a long time ago. That is going back. I mean, uh, you know, goodness me, uh, that's well over 20 But years. Um, you see what used to happen in the old days? If a DJ on the radio wanted a record, he had to go to the archives and pick it out. Mm. But now, and then 20 years ago, the DJs and the producers were making up their own collections. Yeah. So what I did, I got the Radio Times, picked out all the producers and DJs, and I sent them all a copy. And suddenly, overnight, it was on early morning radio, and in the afternoon. And then David Allen from Radio 2 rang me up and said, Bob, I want to do an interview with you, but of course, the only way we can do it is 
I'll send you a list of questions. You get your cassette player and put the answers on, and I'll put it all together. So one night, I'm driving up from Bristol at quarter past one in the morning, and suddenly this song, Restless of Mine, comes on. And he says, this is Bob McKinley with Restless. And then, of course, the interview came on. And it just sounded like a genuine interview because he pieced it all together. But yeah. do you know, uh, for every play you get on Radio 1, right. you get 48 quid. 48 quid for that? Who, who just gets one that? play. I get, get that. You get that as, as the songwriter. Yeah, that's right. right. And uh, I got a cheque for £500 for that. Fantastic. So they let the, it build up until it gets to about a nice little figure like that and, and send you a cheque. Well, they, nice. they send the playlist through to uh, the Pub Publishing Rights Society. Yeah. And it's yeah. them who send the cheque because ah, the right. BBC has sent the cheque to uh, the never, publishers. Yeah, I never knew how that worked. I know I do. Yeah, thanks. yeah. Oh, well, thanks for telling me and that. What you, you just send a cheque through the post right, and that's it. Right. So this track, Restless, have we got it lined up there, Diane? It's uh, track nine, I think. And um, we've we'll just switched songs there, just because Bob's wax lyrical there about <laughs> the song Restless. Lurical. And I'm dying to know, because it's going to have to be our last song of the evening. Oh, that's we're okay. going to sign off our, from this. But you're definitely coming back, aren't you, Bob? Oh, yeah. Because we've got to... We've got, like I said, we've only just scratched the surface here and we'll come back and do another session and see how far we get with that because there might be another one after that, I, I suspect. So there you go. This is Restless by Bob McKinley. <laughs>
Restless by Bob McKinley. I'm impressed, absolutely, totally and utterly impressed. And I've had a great time talking to you, Bob, tonight. Thank you very much, Bill. It's Thank been a pleasure. You very much. I hope it has. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's so exciting for me. You know, I put Lanky Beat together as a website and started collating all the information about all the bands. Yeah. And then we developed it into um, Lanky Cats, the live music side. And then yeah. Diane came on the scene. And then developed it into a radio program. I mean, it, it's just like unbelievable. So, and three years ago, there was like nothing. And uh, I hope that we're beginning now to make the world sit up and see what we've got here in Lancashire. Oh in yeah. Newball. We are at the cutting edge of it all. And um, and I hope that the world now starts to finally listen to us. Thank yeah, that's uh, live music that. needs to come back. Absolutely, absolutely. In yeah. my day. Yep. Yeah. Every pub in Wigan had a band in. Yeah, it did. We played one night and there was only two in. Yeah. And halfway through the first number, they went. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and we got five oh, quid. Uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, coming along tonight, it's been fantastic. Graham Lithgow's brought you up here. That's right, yeah. He's your mind, a taxi driver and big long-standing friend. That's Thank right. Thank you very much, Graham. Without you. Pleasure. Yeah. And Diane, our producer of... Wrightington Hospital Radio, the chair of Wrightington Hospital Radio. Everything revolves around Diane at Wrightington Hospital Radio. Thank you very, 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 very much. You're welcome. And uh, thank you for listening, everybody. And um, we hope you've enjoyed tonight's show. Look out for, again on Lanky Beat for future shows. And we'll see you all very soon. Good night, everybody. Good night. Broadcasting weekday evenings, Wrightington Hospital Radio. 